So, thanks again. Appreciate y'all appreciate joining us. Um, I've actually been trying to figure out a way to get this topic introduced here for a little while. Um, talking about databases. And right now, this particular presentation is more about databases in general. Now, we're going to have a certain amount of focus on RDBMSs, relation to database or management system. But it's about databases in general and what they're used for and how we use them. Um, so, so Pat's going to be kind of a kind of a primer because yeah, you know, what we had talked we, about, the, there's a yeah. number of people who want to get more into the back end kind of thing. Yeah. Hopefully it'll be still useful to people who are familiar with relational data, databases to get, maybe get into some concepts that you had heard of. And, and understand, the databases on their own is a topic that can last a lifetime. All right. And, and we won't get anywhere near the level of, of some of that, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to answer some of your questions that may be outstanding you just haven't understood about them or haven't or wanted to know more about them. And hopefully we can help begin that search today. Um, we're hoping that there will be other uh, lunch and learns that will follow up on this that will build upon some of the vocabulary that we're going to go through here. But we really need to start off with a primer to help you understand where things stand, what they're for, and why do we use them. All right? So, kind of going back, I was, uh, I was struck by this. Um, you know, the, in the, the first uh, original Star Trek series, they called databases data banks. And I always thought that was kind of funny, but then I found out that the actual paper that defines relational database management systems was called a relational model of data for large shared data banks. Uh, that, that title threw me so hard. Was like, oh, well, the original what? Star Trek series came out around the time we were yeah. the relational databases did too. Mm -hmm. late 60s. Exactly. Yeah, in the late 60s. So the first paper came out in 70. And it gave those who are, are give at least a little bit of uh, relevance there. The C language, the most popular language ever developed, was developed between 69 and 73. And SQL was, was devised or out of uh, Edgar Codd's paper based on the relational model. And pretty much all relational models in computer science today is still referring back to that original. Um, so yeah, this is all crap. Um, so kind of going back to uh, a, another relevant aspect. Um, so databases and data storage. Um, there's plenty of examples. You know, when we first started doing some of this stuff, most of the databases that we were dealing with were all file-based databases. Right. They stored it in some proprietary format in a singular file, and if that file was locked, so was the records that were involved in that file. So there were a lot of different mechanics that were involved to try and make file-based databases work. Um, but some of them that you're familiar with now involve Git, uh, SVN, CDS for those older of us folks who remember those uh, storage repos. Uh, if you remember Visual uh, Source Safe was another one. Um, but those were all file-based databases. They didn't involve any kind of engine-based or infrastructure-based systems. All right? They didn't have to talk to any kind of uh, uh, memory construct that organized data into certain aspects. It didn't have to do any of that. It was all very, very simple. Um, but the moment you start dealing with... They were also very clunky. The they were also very clunky. That's absolutely true. But, at, but the moment you had to start dealing with things like concurrency, and that word's going to come up every now and again. We'll get into that later. We'll get into that later mm -hmm. in detail, but right now just suffice it to say that any two things that happen at the same time is going to cause a problem. For, for example, there's a data, there's a record of data in the database. Jim is trying to edit it at the same time I'm trying to edit it. Who Which wins? one wins? That's the currency. And that's what these <coughs> engine-based systems 
were brought up to, to resolve, you know, ultimately. Now, there's a whole bunch of other things and complicated concepts and whatnot yeah. that followed all of that, but that's where that's born out of. Um, so, an, an engine base, obviously, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, My, MySQL, Postgres, uh, uh, Mongo, CouchDB, Cassandra, all of these are databases that are engine based. They have logic, they have memory constructs within them that manages how data transfers um, through a, and often a transactional basis, but all of it boils down to how is data committed? And committed, uh, and then in this case, anytime we're talking about commitment, we're talking about data being saved, data being at rest. So they also have all kinds of algorithms to optimize queries, so if you want to um, pull the data out of the database, this query optimization engine will look at the way you've written this, your query, and say, what's the, the most efficient way to pull that data out that, they're at, that the query is asking? And that even came, got to the point to where they even had specific notation so that you could prevent the optimizer from doing that. So, or, and, or give it hits. Yeah. So, this is just all just starting things off. So let's let's get to the vocab. Um, Can everyone see this, by the way? Do so I need to make it larger? Think big bucket, all right? At any one point, we can get more detail than that, but database equals big bucket of data. For every aspect in that big bucket, we're going to be talking about records. That is the essential data for any one particular thing we want to track out of the big bucket. And then transactions, are going to refer to any time when that data needs to change state. Now what we mean by changing state is just a change of one sort or another. Now that state could, could uh, culminate into any number of factors, but we'll keep it simple. We're talking about changing it from one state and one condition to another state or condition. And in most cases, it's a about how valid is that ending state? And again, going back to the point of what's that? What does that data look like at rest? Okay. Do an example of what a transaction is with a with bank accounts. Hypothetically, Jim has a bank account. He's got a balance of hundred dollars in there, Ooh. and I have a, a bank account. It also has a balance of $100. Hypothetically, I want to send Jim $10. Okay, two things have to happen in order for that to be, in order, in order to maintain the integrity of the data. This would have to be changed to $90, debit my account $90, and Jim's would have to be credited by $10. That's a transaction. It's all or nothing. If we only debit my account and Jim doesn't have, have the corresponding credits, that's inconsistent. Ten dollars just went poof. That's an invalid state. Right. That's why we use transactions so that we can combine all the all, all operations in one uh, atomic unit. It's either all it either all happens or none of it happens, and it's to enforce the integrity of the data. Right. And that takes us right into what. In the database world, what's known as ASCII, and any new database system that comes out today is going to be uh, presented the ACID test, as it were. All right, so you got atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. You don't really have to remember any of this. Just remember, ACID test is equal to can this database be used in, in a enterprise? 
consistent fashion. Oh, just think that. But the atomicity is going to come back again and again. All right. And what that basically means is indivisible. And in the case of a transaction, um, you know, we're talking about this. All the changes that were involved in that transaction are indivisible from any other action that can possibly be happening in the system at the same time. Can't be broken down any further. With that, no. that, that so that uh, and like like Patrick was saying, for to, to maintain atomicity, when a change or a transaction happens, all of the transaction is good, or none of it is. So then, anything that was transpiring during that transaction, if that failed for whatever reason, and there's a, a myriad of those, everything that was before gets reset to the way it was. So the entire transaction looks like it never even happened. No one even like it never even was tried. All right, so we remain in a, in a valid state. And the moment that that transaction happens and is committed, like I was mentioning before, then that is then uh, sealed and saved and data at rest to a valid change. And then the database is ready for the next transaction. Right. Um, so the rest of this stuff, really again, kind of goes back to validity, concurrency, and how things exist at rest. All right, so another concept we're going to be talking about is elements. So I wanted to make sure I was, I was very clear on this concept, and we'll get into this uh, in a bit more detail later. An element is any one piece of data. Um, in this particular case, let's say uh, where you live. All right. So all the data is relative to the location of where you stay. Um, that can be uh, uh, expressed as a place. Now your place probably has an address. All right. And that address, you know, you ever look at it, any form you fill out. It's going to have a number of fields in it. But you can break that address down into different other fields, like zip code. But nowadays, you can also break that zip code down into two parts of codes in this area. And in um, some parts in, in Europe, that's a multiple section of numbers. Um, so that's when you can break it down, when you cannot break it down any further, that is the concept of an atomic element cannot be divided any further. And still, I'm sorry, it could probably be divided further, it just wouldn't have any relevance. So that's probably more key to understand is breaking that data down to its relevant uh, simplest part. An example might be a person's name. It could be broken down into first name, last name, but you wouldn't break down first name any further, down into individual letters. There's no relevance there. There's no nothing to be gained by breaking it down into individual letters. So the smallest that you would break it down to would be a field for first name. Right. All right. So um, the next concept I wanted to kind of present to everyone here is what's known as the domain of concern. So the best way it's it's kind of good as it but. The whole point of a domain of concern is that if we go back to the big bucket idea of what a database is, so on any one given system, there are potentially hundreds or thousands of data points that you want to cover. Because of the way databases work, it's always easier on the database to be performant if it's looking in the same places for the same information. So if you have some data in one table or, or relative analogy, then it should be looking in the same place for that same kind of data and not looking at four or five different tables for the same information. Now this will go back over to another point of, 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 of normalizing forms, but we'll get to that. Uh, an example would be um, if I had 
uh, a table on cities, but then I broke those tables down into separate states, and then I broke those, you know, and broke corresponding names of cities to the different countries that they exist. You know, those kinds of organizations violates what's known as the domain of concern. So the domain of concern basically talks about how you're going to look at the grouping of data fields. Um, um, like I said, it's, it is a bit on the esoteric side, but let's, I think I may be able to present that concept a little bit better a little later when we try and go through a practical application of some of the stuff that we're covering. Right, so we'll, we'll come back to that if you don't mind. But it does pull back down to the relevance of parent information to the relevance of children information. Um, and speaking of relevance, relationships. So, give an example of parent-child relationships. Right. You'll we'll see this notation used a lot when somebody diagrams out a database. This, this, what I've drawn here, is a one-to-many relationship. This is the one side, this is the many side. Easy to remember because this one, this side has more fingers on it than this one. An example of a, a, a one-to-many relationship might be when you go to Amazon, you are a customer. And as a customer, you can place many orders. Each customer can have many orders, but each order has only one customer. That, in, is, in essence, is one to many relationship. Right. So, so just any, one kind of relationship. Right. That's so, the most common. But that's where, so where the colons come into play, it's got to be consistent always. So it's not that it's kind of one to many sometimes and maybe a one to one in other times. It's always a consistent relationship. Um, now, with RGBMSs, what's definitely one of the tougher concepts is the many to many. So, if, uh, if you could just draw, draw me two tables, And then out of each of those tables, let's have one column as an item. talk about the, the one to many what'll end up happening is that let's say orders has an ID and then orders also has another field called customer all right so customer would have an ID field so to meet that one to many relationship then the orders customer field would have to have the ID of the customer in it. So when you look at asking for give me all the orders with this customer ID in it, that's straightforward. The problem becomes when that customer has to then be associated back to its order. Or in that case, that doesn't really work because then you have a violation of integrity. <clears throat> to solve the many-to-many -many problem, we have what's known as an intersection table. And that, that part is probably the least explained points of why the table even exists. And when you look at a database that has them, they don't look like they're providing a whole bunch of value because all they look like, draw one, uh, uh, the, the intersection table. So, right.
So then when you look at that intersection table, all it's got is a series of numbers. There's no other real data in it. Because all it's trying to do is line up what are, what are the entries of this that equal the entries of this. So what I've drawn here is imagine if you had a school that had a number of clubs in it. Each person can belong to multiple clubs or groups. Each group can have multiple people in it. That's many, many relationships. What this does is it associates any person for every any time a person is in a specific club, you have one record. It's each club that that person belongs in. You would also have for each group, you would have one record in here for each person that was in there. But each combination of person ID and group ID would occur only once. And there's a lot of cases where this particular scenario comes up. And, and I'm always stunned at the number of databases that don't utilize this logic to try and organize that data correctly. It's really rather fascinating that that, well, that still happens to the day. Really, well, obviously. Well, I've, seen, I've, some I've, I've, I've seen things where on the person table you'll have something like this. In groups and then common delimited? Yep. Oh, and then in groups you'll have yeah. just a, 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 like a list of names all separated by commas or semicolons or something like that, which is well, do, it does store the data. Yeah. But it gets it, it, it becomes very nasty when you try to query that data. Like, what if you want to find if, if you do? Didn't have any of these two tables. You only have this. What you find? Wanted to find who, who is all in the on the football team. Yeah. You'd have to look through all these and try to parse out the data in that field for football team. Yeah. So how would someone uh, validate the data? That's the data. Oh, that does, that does become this is problematic. All right. But there's no outside of this design. There's no good answer as an alternative. Would it be a requirements, like a technical requirements? It would absolutely be a, a, along those, sure. But on on any, so we'll get into the forms here in a, in a short bit, but just that example that Patrick noted, that already violates personal the form. To answer this question, I don't think you really test it. You have to validate that when you do the architecture. If you prove the architecture that is correct, um, you can have to really have a good Yeah. So, and then uh, just real quick, I wanted to go back through your, the, we've already kind of exemplified some of it, some of the basic notation of, of schema development. So what we're talking about here is an actual scheme. So your, you know, just a line to line, that's a one to one. Line to what we know known as a crow's foot. That's a one to many. Crow's foot on both sides is essentially many to many, but obviously that in the eventual schema, you know, that's that's fine to express in an ERD, what's most known as entity relationship data, uh, uh, diagram. Um, but when it gets down to the point of actually describing that schema, you can't express it that way. Sometimes you'll see this relationship diagram is this. There's many to many on both sides, and they just leave out the this table between. It's sort of implied. Yeah. This is sort of a shorthand for this notation. You could never really actually model this in a database because there's no way to have a many to many relationship in a data relationship database without having that intermediate table. Right. So there's a, so there's a concept of ERDs, entity relationship diagrams and DSDs, data schema diagrams. Uh, so you can't actually programmatically go against an ERD. You can programmatically go against a DSD. So just understand that there's that relative difference. The ERD is more like pseudocode. It's like an outline. But the DSD is what actually brings in the information in a particular format. And there's a number of different terms for these, these things as yeah. well. This would, I've heard this called a conceptual data diagram, which is somebody just doing it more at a high level and not necessarily having all the details in it, where this is actually a physical data model. Again, there's a number of different terms that can be used for this. It depends on, usually, it will depend on what organization or what company you're working for. You had a question? Yeah. Are there any times you want to use a bitwise column to prevent doing an extra joint when you're doing your query? Well, there's plenty of reasons for using a bitwise. 
obviously. But they do tend to be highly specialized needs, and they don't conform to a specific data type. It's, it's more of a conceptual data type, and tends to fly right over the heads of most DBAs. Yeah, I, I think I've used one a bitwise column maybe once or twice, and you have to write specialized code for it. It's typically not in the database, it's in right. the application code. Wor the, worst, the worst store procedure I've ever written at a, at a bitwise union. <laughs> yeah, actually I had eight of them. All right, so that's the basics on the schema. So, what the hell happened here? Oh, <laughs> well, let's go back to the source. Please stand by your experience in technical difficulties. What did it unfold like your list correctly? Do you need a space? <laughs> Do you need a line break between each of the numbers? Is that what's going on? Alright, so we'll just go from here. Alright, so... Uh, can you change it to wing base? <laughs> sure could, I'm sure. I'm not sure that the results are going to be safe for work, though. I'm writing some obscene justice. So. Um, Patrick, uh, the term intersection table and join table, are those perfect synonyms, or is there a slight difference? I've heard a number of different terms for this. I've heard it called the junction table, and intersection table, and join table. Um, there doesn't really seem to be an industry standard for what we call that thing. I thought um, it was thingy. Yeah, that's what <laughs> those terms. Okay. Uh, that's, that's good. I'm yeah, I'm using using for it. You can feel like other metadata here too. So like, you want to keep like creating time. That way you can see that when one's that person you, you know, assigns that group with like, other data. Right, and I've, I've seen other things here before, um, like an effective date range. Um, like this person, this is more in line with security. For, for example, a computer might be in a, in a security, might be in a role. But starting at this date and time and ending at this date and time, after that date and time, they don't, they're not in that role anymore. Right. And, and that's, that's, there's, there's complexities that you can get into here that we can talk about. And that does kind of come back to. Your, your notions of demand and concern. So, what what are the relevant relevant fields involved when you're trying to track a piece of data? All right. So, normal forms. Um, so, if we didn't talk about layouts in this case of, of separation of information, you could have just one big table that that held all the data necessary for a person, all right? So you would have first name, last name, you'd have address, state, city, uh, you'd have uh, birth date, you'd have other information relevant to other records, but they would then all be in the same table. So you'd be, you, you would have be expressing all this data and essentially copying the same amounts of data on the table an indefinite amount of times. That's a serious strain from a source, uh, a, a, a resource management standpoint. So you got an exorbitantly uh, enlarging the size of your database, and it makes for other in uh, uh, inefficiencies overall in management. Um, so if for whatever reason, uh, a set number of people are located at such and such an office, if part of that person's detail is where they're located at which office, if that office now changes to another location, now you have X number of files in that, or, or, or records that must now be changed because that location changed. Instead of changing it in one place and have it be reflected against all these other records. You also lose what is 
source of truth. For example, if we laid out our database this way, and hypothetically, I have a last name that's frequently misspelled. What if in, in one of these records, on one of my orders, it was spelled correctly, on another record it was spelled differently? Which one's correct? Which is, my, which is the correct last name? Obviously, with last name, it's not that big, big of a deal. It's still a deal. <laughs> what if the address is different between the two? I, if I haven't moved, but in one, uh, in, in, uh, maybe on one record, they put in the wrong address because it would come in because of a typo, and the thing gets shipped to the wrong place. How do you know which one's right, which one's wrong? The answer is you don't. That's a, yet another reason for doing normal, to normalize your data in this structure. Right. So we try, when, when we're doing database development, we're trying to achieve what are known as the first three forms, normal forms. Um, these forms were actually defined originally by Edgar Cott, who wrote about a thousand different papers on, on relational <laughs> models. And the, and the normalizing forms came, came up really, really early. Um, so we try and meet the first three. They tend to be the, they tend to have the most value for the amount of effort involved to, to maintain them. Now the moment you go beyond three though, then you gotta have some very specific requirements for why you want to do that. Uh, it's possible to go all the way up to six normal form. Um, so the, there's a lot of really anal retentive aspects to all these different forms. But the, the first three normal forms go like this. So first, go ahead. just to give you some context, I've been working with databases for over 20 years. I don't think I've ever worked on a database that's been the author of normal form. I've worked on one once. So above the normal form and that's it. Above, so above third normal form is kind of academic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so just to get into it, each of the three normal form, or actually each of the numbered normal forms always have a predicate of the previous number normal form has been satisfied. So we can't get to six normal form without meeting the first spot. Meeting the first spot. All right, and so they'll all read like this. So first normal form says that the domain of each attribute contains only atomic values. Now I realize I'm giving you the dictionary definition of what these are. Now I'm going to translate each one of these into English somehow. But I, or I will give it my best out of that. How about that? I believe that refers to this scenario we just had up on the Yes, it is. All right, so. This is not an atomic value because it can be broken down into individual groups. Exactly. So in English, any defined field has only one value. The moment that one field represents more than one, it violates first normal form, and no other normal forms after that can be observed. All right, so. And in that case, in another case, I was, I was looking at it. So if you ever look at your average form out there, you almost always see a line one and a line two for your address, almost, on, almost always. And so in this case, if it was just one address line, but it had both those values in it. Now, is that necessarily a big deal on that? Well, that's up to you. Uh, ultimately, this is up to you whether that's sufficiently atomic or not. But the fact that the, the, the industry at large will recognize line one and line two basically points that out as being not first normal form. Okay? So, second normal form must be in line with first normal form. And no field has a part key dependency. Now this part, I know, is going to be a little bit rough, so stay with me on this one. If there is a key dependency, no field should be defined that violates that dependency. So for those of us who are developers, think dry. Do not repeat yourself. All right, so if I have a uh, Let's say I want to express my house in Georgia. And I say, my Georgia house in Georgia. 
Well, if I have a if I have a key relevance to Georgia, I don't need to preface the fact that the house is my Georgia house. The key is already defining that it's in Georgia, right? Does that make sense? So another example that I, 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 I tried to think of a specific example that I had seen, and I couldn't really think of one off the top of my head. But think of it like in English. I took my football helmet to football practice. Well, that's good. <laughs> you know, but that's kind of redundant. And that's what it's trying to prevent, is that redundancy in maintaining data at rest. Is that fair? Questions on that? Because that one is kind of loopy. <coughs> All right. So third one. Must be in second normal form. And every non-prime, in other words, non-key based attribute field of a record is non-transitively dependent on every key of that record. What that basically means in English, every non-key field must provide a fact about the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. So, and, and, and this is actually a, 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 a geek funny in the field, is everything on da 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 da, -da so help me cod. Um, you know, relevant to Edgar Codd. So, again, it's, it's dry. Again. Um, so, the, the best example I can give you is if you had a record of your car, all right, and that record was going to describe your car, but you had specific keys that were relevant to other fields that it already described who the make was and that there was also another key that was specific to the model, well then that record that, rel that relates to those keys might only have the color of it, the, the, the VIN, and maybe the number of doors. All right, so it's just describing what the keys do not. And that's all a record should be relevant to. Right? And that keeps your database. If your, your database can be third normal form completely, and you've got the least number of tables, for the least amount of data, consistent. And so any change to data on, uh, on, on relevant data <coughs> to other records ends up also reducing the amount of actions that the database will have to do to make that change relevant to all other records. All right? So if for whatever reason you, were, you had a Ford, but then Ford got bought by somebody and now it's a new name. Well, all you did, all you have to do is change the name Ford. And now all the, all the Fords are changed. I'm just trying to look for one of the examples. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that I'm giving a good example of this a third normal form here, but the fact that major address is here when it's not. <coughs> that's oh. that's that's uh, first normal form violation. Okay, so I didn't come up with a good example. No, it's all good. It's, 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 it's hard to yeah. come up with, with distinct right, so, of these. Right, so um, after but, a while, if you start using these, you just kind of do it without really thinking about it because it's so ingrained in you to, to do it that way. You're right, and it is trying to explain. <laughs> well, no, 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 yes. no, 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 but you're close. Let's say instead of maker address, you had the size of engine. All right, let's, let's say you had size of engine as a field. Now, over time, uh, any, anybody in the, in the cars knows there's only so many engines possible. Only so many. And, and, and they've been doing this for years, so there, there's very few 24-cylinder engines <coughs> so there's always going to be something less than that so you can define that out of a single table and then be relevant to that so as long as that is a finite value possible then you can make that into a table and then make that a relevant field and relate that back to the particular table of car now if you don't then you're going to have engine size basically repeated for every record in the database and that's an inefficiency <coughs> So while in and of itself that's not violating third normal form, the fact that you would have repetitive data like that does. That make sense? Sort of? Yeah. 
Okay, so if you guys were going to design a database to represent all of us here, and we had like five different job titles here, and the job title is a string like interface engineer, <coughs> whatever, software engineer, would you make the job titles its own table? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's exactly the same concept. So, yes, maybe on, on the outside of it, holding that one value doesn't really represent that great of a value savings overall by adding it to. Mm -hmm. But if by representing your job title, there was also other data that was associated to your job title, then that would be relevant. Because for you to track that data right now, all you've got is the person table. And that's no place for those additional fields. They're not providing extra value to just the keys that are relevant. And again, that same, that same logic <coughs> goes backwards, too. So another example would be to have a separate, uh, a, a separate row in that table to represent, let's say, IE2, and then have another one that said um, view only. All right, so that, that, that's not providing enough value out of that, you know, you know, so maybe what you end up having is a, a Boolean value in, in, in that table that says, do they do view? Do they do this? Do they do this? You know, you can do that kind of thing, and that's still adding value, but having a separate row for that. I've, I've seen it where we have this kind of layout where this is just a numerated value. And a lot of times we do that for something like the status field. Mm -hmm. Whereas older databases, like back in the 70s, they would put like just a single character here and somebody would have to know what each of those characters means. Like mm -hmm. A means, oh, it's active. D means it's deleted. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we tend to go, that's back when disk space was at a premium. Now mm -hmm. disk space is extremely yeah. <coughs> Now we would tend to break that out into its own table and actually put more meaningful information here. So that ID is probably not going to be very meaningful to you. Nobody's going to be able, probably no one's going to be able to look at that a job title idea and recognize, oh, that's an interface engineer one, or that's an architect, or whatever it might be. So a lot of times we will break that out just so <coughs> if we ever want to change that name. We want to say we don't want to we don't want to say IE one anymore, but we want to specifically spell it out, interface engineer. So we might want to add something on for each yeah. job title as like maybe salary range or I don't know, something else that might be related to that specific position. You'll sometimes see it with like um, even going as far as state, use a state code instead of GA. And for the two reasons, one is you get the, the validation. You can't accidentally get GZ in there, then you're like, what was that supposed to be? And then the other is, like you said, if you wanted to add more data later, maybe we wanted to put a, you know, a, a area code, valid area codes, or valid tax rates, or something like that. So. Or I've change the data. To the state's example, I've seen it where it starts out in just this U.S. states, mm -hmm. and then as the application grows, it, they expand into Canada. So yeah. now we need to add Canadian Virgin provinces. Islands. Mm -hmm. It becomes very, it's just a data exercise. There's no code that needs to mm -hmm. change. You just add Canadian provinces to your table. And well, and, and the other aspect, kind of going back to the, the storage thing, while not as big of an issue as it was once, but it's still an issue because it's a resource that the database engine has to manage. Mm -hmm. So. Just because you have larger data, it's not, you know, larger hard drives now, doesn't mean that that becomes automatically easier. And it still means it's something that the database engine has to deal with, regardless of how big it is. So when you talk about these things, I know this is getting really geeky, but the difference between even a two-letter code and just a singular number is actually a big deal when you're talking about 150 million records. It becomes huge. And the numbers that are involved in some of this stuff is amazing. That, that we're able to even function at all in some cases. It almost, it's really it kind of, out. Yeah, it really does. So being as efficient as possible early on is always going to be the better key. All right, the better way of going forward. All right, so I know we got to wrap things up. We're a little over time now, and I apologize. But just real quick on, on some of this. So with uh, normalization, one of the other aspects that I wanted to touch base on was what's known as denormalization. Now, uh, Patrick and I were talking about this earlier, 
And in most cases, what you end up finding is a denormalization process is found in data warehouses. Now, the reason why that's the case is because when you have these, these data points broken out into separate tables, it does take time to line those up and get the records that you need out of, out of a particular data set. All right? And in data warehouses, they're dealing with such large data sets that they'll actually see better performance by flattening the data into tables that look like they're violating every single normal form possible. All right? But it's all in the, the aspect of speed. Chances are, though, all that data came through a third normal form database to begin with. And if it made it at rest there, then when it makes it at rest at the data warehouse, you don't have to worry so much about the data inconsistencies. And there's a lot of different pieces and parts out there to try and address those. They still come up. Um, but denormalization is uh, an interesting topic and definitely one worth understanding in that we also see that in regular databases as well also again to get that speed and, and efficiency. So the, the example I've written out here is imagine you're on Amazon's website and you, you're placing an order, you order a number of different things, different quantities. The order line would the, the order line table would have product this would be some sort of indicator of what what's the product that you have. They have some sort of internal ID to identify the product. How many did you order? Quantity, unit price, what's the cost for each one of them? It could be a dollar piece, two dollars a piece. The total price for the whole order would be multiple for every one of these order lines, multiply the quantity by the unit price and add it all up. Add tax, add shipping, and so on. A lot of times you might see, let's just put a total price on the order, rather than having to calculate that every single time we want to know what the total price is. It's much more efficient to just look up the total price than to have to calculate it. Right. And when we get into other later lunch and learns, we'll get into some of what those kinds of things involve. There's a lot of different mechanics that, that can be applied to make that even easier, um, just just natural. So you know, that's the benefit of the engine style systems and over a lot of the file based systems that we'll find out there. Um, so just real quick to go through, um, there are a number of, of aspects between SQL and NoSQL. I tried to, to kind of lay out what some of this stuff looks like. Um, but just maybe we should hold off on that and see if there's, a, if there's any questions or comments about anything that we talked yeah. about. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, Open and hold on the can of worms that we start getting. Yeah, then, well, I, I was actually just going to skim over this, but having questions at this point is going to be good. Anyone have anything? I have one small follow up. Go ahead. So if I were to have put job title ID and job title name in that employee table, as well as over there in that job title table, what rule would I be breaking? Like, how would I describe that? That breaks normal form. Yeah, that already breaks first normal Okay, this is a first normal form. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Think about if you ever change the job title description, like mm -hmm. software engineer, you make it software developer. If that's in the employee table, you have to change it in, you know, every record that it is. Whereas yeah, if, it's, exactly. if it's abstracted out to the job title, and I'm sold yeah, you're dealing with a small company. But Microsoft, if they got to change, you know, the job title of 100,000 employees, you know, that's a lot of work for the database. Right, and and that's almost your first indicator that you've lost the first form already. The moment you can go through that scenario and not see 50 gajillion I.O. rewrites because data, you know, data had to be changed in, relevant, in the same relevant table, you already know you've lost first and you kind of touched on it when you were talking about data warehouses, but it's the trade-off. The trade-off yeah. is updating versus reading. But Whichever one, you, if you break it the more normal form, then the easier it is to update, but the slower it is to read, generally. Well, well, a, well actually, so just, and I will take two seconds to try and explain this. So the, the, the biggest difference between what a transactional database is and what a data warehouse is, or a data mart is often referred to. The difference between the two. A transactional system is excellent at telling you what things are like right now. It's current state. So you want to go back and change your record? You absolutely can. All right. That's now the new current state. 
data warehouses and data marts are better at telling you what things are over a consistent period of time. And the best example I can give you is that if I were to say, let's write a report that gives me all the, 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 the billing orders for the last six months, all right, and give me a total readout of that, those numbers, I will get one thing right now, but then a week from now, someone's gone back over and had to redo one of those orders or whatever, I run that same report again, it is now a new different number, period. With a data mark, I can find out what was it six months ago, what is that correlation now six months plus one, I can now time shift that over to just the last six months and see what that number is, and those numbers will always be consistent in a data model. Always, always, always. Now, to be fair, you can't do that in a transactional database. And just if you were on the scale, say Amazon, where you had millions of orders and you were trying to slice your data different ways to analyze it, like how were sales in this you know, based on region of country or based on the demographics of who ordered it or any number of variables, to try to do that in a transactional database, the forms would be absolutely horrible. Well, in some cases, Which, it well, can't you can't, even be done. yeah, in some cases, in some cases like, it can't even be done. So, like, let's say I want to know how many how many orders over the last six months have been canceled. All right. Depending on how you're holding your data, you may not even be able to answer that question out of a transactional system. But in a data mart, you absolutely can. Well, I was you thinking even, see even how many were orders were placed and how many were canceled. And you will know exactly. I was thinking even more something like um, if you were talking about, let's say you had a country code, mm -hmm. and one of your country codes was Czechoslovakia or East Germany. You know, now you might just have an order there. Yeah. Just talking about yeah. That. So, you know, if you say you know it's valid, code eighty eight is East Germany in nineteen fifty, but it's just Germany in two thousand seventeen. So, which which one do you use when you're going back and looking at history? Exactly. Right, and, and a transactional database cannot provide that right. kind of information because it's only optimized for telling you what right now it is, regardless of what that condition is. You can kind of do it, but it's cumbersome. No, no, yeah. I, and I've tried yeah. to do it. And it you can do it, it like is, sequence numbers and things like that. It is largely mm -hmm. doable as long as you are not going off the rails too far. Mm -hmm. But with a data mark, exactly. Mm -hmm. So with, with, with a data mark on the other hand, Active. it doesn't matter. You've got mm -hmm. all the time in the world. It is what it is. They, they actually have what's known as slowly changing dimensions. And that whole part of that is to know how has something changed over time. The exact, mm -hmm. the exact same order, the exact same, the same product item, what happened. Country code would be a good example of slowly changing dimension. Mm -hmm. the example, they, they would just mm -hmm. take like a city in, in that, that used to be what used to be called East Germany is now in Germany. Mm -hmm. So the country code for that city is a slowly changing dimension. Mm -hmm. Right. It changes probably once in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I just wanted to cover that just Extended. real quick as far as the normalization was concerned and, and about data warehouses. Um, I, I wish we had more time to kind of go through this aspect of the vocabulary. I really wanted to kind of show what the difference was between um, how SQL databases work as opposed to NoSQL databases, but we just don't have the time. It's just too deep to get into, and I don't know that you get quite as much value as what we've already covered. So um, I wanted us to go through a practical exercise, um, but I'm afraid we just don't have the time. Um, we'll have to save that one for my next one in December. Um, so with that, Patrick and I both Thank you all very much for joining us. I hope you got some time. If you have any other questions,